Sadiq? Sir, we are live, sir. Good day to all those who tuned in. Welcome to Anek Dara's webinar on Israel-Palestine conflict, outlook for the West Asia and the world. Sadiq? Sir, we are live, sir. So, oh, sorry for the interruption. West Asia, West Asia has been and is a cauldron of people of different cultures, ethnicities, religions, and languages. Thus, it has rich and diverse traditions, but also has a long history of conflicts from around the 10th century BCE. The emergence of various nations and also non-state actors have complicated the situation here. Added to that is the role of the imperial powers in the politics of the region for geopolitical interests and also with an eye on oil and natural gas resources of the region. Events after October 23rd, 23rd and the related consequent human tragedy have again highlighted the need for lasting solutions in the region. It is in this context we are addressing this topic and to talk to us is Ambassador Sri Talmir Ahmad, IFS retired, former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman and UAE and the UAE and Chair Ram Sethe, Chair for International Studies, Symbiosis International University. We are fortunate to have Sri Ahmad with us both both for his immense experience in the region and for clear articulation of his thoughts on the topic. The session will be moderated by Sri Chetan Rana, doctoral student JNU. I'll introduce Sri Rana and hand over the podium to him. Sri Rana, though qualified as a civil engineer from Manipal, changed the track and switched over to political science and international relations. After doing his MA from JNU, he joined as a research student in JNU. He is in the final year, he is currently in final year working on a topic related to populism and Indian diaspora. For a young person, his extracurricular activities are everybody's envy. He worked as a teaching associate for two courses, edited for, edited for the newsletter of Opus and for many other organizations. Worked as intern in, a, intern in a number of organizations, including Terry, and also with Dr. Manali Kumar of University of St. Gallen, Switzerland presented papers in a number of conferences and workshops. Thank you, Sri Rana, for accepting to be the moderator for the webinar and over to you for further conduct of proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I guess this is an interesting as well as a tragic time to be studying international politics. We have a number of conflicts going on in the world, whether it's the Russia-Ukraine conflict or the crisis in Myanmar, Congo, Sudan. But since October 7, there has been one conflict that has captured all the limelight, all the attention, and that has been the Israel-Palestine conflict or the Israel war on Gaza or the Israel-Hamas war. People will call it depending on where they stand. Since October 7, over 31,000 people have died, including nearly 30,000 Palestinians, over 1,400 Israeli civilians. And even though all conflicts are complex, the Israel-Palestine issue starting in the 1940s remains to be one of the most complex, most multifaceted, a crisis that has evolved through the decades. And it remains as a very special conflict to study as well as discuss, as well as to reminisce about and regretfully look back at the tragic history of this conflict over the decades uh, because there are many factors involved. There's a factor of colonialism, whether the way the Israeli state was established in the 1940s or whether we're talking about the nature of the Israeli state in the contemporary times. There's a question of international law, whether it's the Palestinian statehood or the right of return of the Palestinian refugees or whether we're talking about today, whether there's a question of genocide involved or not. Then there's also a question of how diplomacy works and has evolved over the decades from being a pariah in the international system, Israel is today a very key member of the emerging international order. We have seen uh, a lot of states, including India, which did not have diplomatic ties with Israel, gradually normalized ties with Israel. And today, Israel is a key part of the Indian uh, diplomatic network. And we also had the most important development in the West Asian politics. That was the uh, emergence of the Abraham Accords, where the Gulf states were normalizing ties with Israel. And now all of that has come to sort of a halt because of this ongoing conflict. So 
I guess we could have no better speaker to talk about this issue than Ambassador Talimi Zahmad. It's a privilege for all of us to have you here, sir. You're a credible and a commanding voice when it comes to West Asian politics. So for people who are meeting Ambassador Ahmed for the first time, he joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1974. In his illustrious diplomatic uh, service career, he served in Kuwait, Iraq, Yemen, UK, US, and South Africa. He was also the ambassador of India to Saudi Arabia, to Oman and UAE. And he also served as the director general of ICWA, that is the Indian Council on World Affairs, during 2006 and 7. He currently holds the Ram Sathya chair in the Symbiosis International uh, University, Pune, and is also author of several amazing books on West Asia. And I'd highly recommend everyone who's interested in West Asian politics to go and check out his books. So, sir, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, and yeah, uh, everyone, uh, please keep dropping in your questions. We'll take note of them. And after the sir's presentation, we'll ask sir those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I have a short uh, PowerPoint presentation that I will initially use to introduce the subject and to bring the narrative up to date, uh, make a few remarks about the ongoing conflict as well and the various ramifications that this conflict has had. Uh, and some observations, uh, what I call first observations, relating to the conflict, uh, to the Gaza war uh, that has occurred so far. So let me quickly go uh, with, with the presentation and uh, put it before you. Is the presentation up there or not yet? No, sir. Not yet, sir. Yeah. No, you're uh, sharing the wrong screen. Yeah. Is it there before you now? Uh, yes, yes, sir. sir. Yes, yes, sir. All of you can see it? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. So uh, let us quickly go forward with our uh, remarks. The uh, As you can see, the issue of Palestine is very deeply connected with the three Abrahamic faiths. You have in the same space. So there are three faiths, the uh, Jewish faith, Christianity, and Islam, all three intimately connected with the soil of uh, Israel, Palestine. And then also you have a people. You have people claiming the same space for themselves in a complex set of circumstances, which is a combination of people and place and the competition between them. I don't want to give you a very long uh, and turgid history. Very quickly to say to you that there is a process in terms of which the Jewish community, mainly in Europe, started migrating to the Holy Land, as it was called, uh, it was at that time under the British. So it was the British mandated territory of Palestine. The Jewish community migrated to uh, and started slowly increasing their numbers. Uh, the existing Palestinian Arab community was already there. And obviously there was a scenario of competition and conflict between them. The British abruptly ended their mandate because they could not manage the conflicts that had emerged, gave them back to the United Nations. The UN came up with a partition plan. The partition plan was viewed as disadvantages to the Palestinian people, and hence there was war. There was a war between the Arab armed forces and the Israelis, and this was the Israelis were uh, immediately victorious mainly because many of them had actually seen action in the Second World War, while the Arab armies were very poorly equipped and had no strategy or tactics, and at the same time had never seen proper conflict. Be that as it may, the end of 1948 war, which is regarded as a catastrophe or Nakba by the Palestinian people, the, uh, the Israel got most of the territory of mandated Palestine with small parts given to neighboring states, uh, and, uh, the West Bank went to uh, went to Jordan, 
and the Gaza Strip went to uh, went to Egypt. But the main impact of this war was that a large number of Palestinians living there were uprooted and they became displaced and many of them became refugees and are now even today very large numbers of them and their descendants are refugees. So that 85% of the people of Palestine were displaced and many of them found a home in neighboring country, temporary home in neighboring country. But the 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 war of 1967 was extraordinarily de devastating as far as Palestinian interest is concerned. This was a regular war in the war in which many Arab armies participated and they were raised against Israel, which was then equipped by the Americans. What the Israelis did is that rather than, rather than wait for any initiative from the Arab side, they preempted uh, uh, they have launched a preemptive attack. There had been a very lot of rhetoric coming from Nasser uh, of Egypt talking about confrontation, conflict, we will throw them into the sea, etc. But now we know, records have indicated that Nasser had no interest in going to war. He had not prepared for war. Not a single meeting between Syrian and, Iran and Egyptian generals had taken place. He actually believed that the international community would intervene and prevent a war from taking place. The Israelis didn't wait for any of this. They launched a massive attack. And within the first two days, the, uh, the Egyptian and Syrian air force was completely destroyed. And after that, uh, before any real action could take place, they had also annihilated the land forces. It was a devastating defeat for the Arabs. And uh, it had numerous implications. Firstly, Israel took back the so-called uh, the territories that had been given to Jordan and Egypt after the war. Therefore, West Bank uh, was given, taken back. The portion of Jerusalem known as East Jerusalem, which was under uh, Jordan, was also taken back. The Gaza Strip was taken back. As, and they all came under Israeli control. Also, Egypt lost its territory, the Sinai Peninsula, which closed the Suez Canal for a very long time. But there were some very important political implications of this conflict. The first is that Israel now realized the importance of engaging with the Americans and to build up a solid political support base in the United States. They mobilized the Jewish community in the United States, made them into a formidable political coalition, and they were able to lobby. They used their uh, various influences in media in uh, uh, and in uh, business, uh, in finance, etc. They became an extremely well-organized support base, lobby base for Israel. They were able to then create the sense that there is a shared heritage between Judaism and Islam and, and Christianity. Do recall here that the part of the problem that the Jewish people had faced in Europe was the animosity that the Christians had for the Jews. As far as United States is concerned, they were able to bridge this gap and the concept of a Judeo-Christian heritage was shaped in the United States it is not very resonant in Europe, but certainly in the United States, you find that the coming together of Jewish and Christian group is part of the support base that they have. A very formidable support base that has emerged since 1967, but has been particularly resonant uh, in this century, has been the group known as Christian Evangelists. These are Christians who believe in the literal word of the Bible, they have a certain view of the uh, of the progress of Christianity uh, in coming years. And they believe that Jewish control over the Holy Land is an important prerequisite for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And therefore, they welcomed the, Christian, the Jewish uh, victories in 1967 and the occupation of the territories that were earlier 
part of Jordan and of uh, Egypt. In Israel itself, there was a sea change in domestic politics. They, till then, Zionism or the Zionists who were founders of Israel were mainly from the left. And they were from the Labour Party, from the socialist background, etc. Now you find, post-1967, a shift to the right. You see the emergence of a right-wing party known as Likud. But separate from Likud, which is a mainstream party on the right, you see the emergence of certain uh, right-wing, extreme right-wing, ultra-nationalist and religious groups as well. There is one last point that I must mention. 1967 war ended one particular commitment on the part of the Arabs. Arab states till then had believed that the restoration of Palestinian rights could be possibly done militarily. 1967 ended that once and for all. Therefore, the issue of Palestine was no longer a military issue as far as the Arab states are concerned. And it became, therefore, the struggle for Palestine and Palestinian interest, therefore, became an overwhelming Palestinian issue. But what, what did not change, and this is important to note, popular opinion all across the Arab world, all the way from Yemen to Morocco, the Arab people themselves remained committed to Palestinian aspirations. At no stage, has the Arab community at large uh, abdicated its commitment to the Palestinian uh, aspiration? Indeed, they believe that Arab identity is shaped by this, uh, uh, by these aspirations, and the fulfillment of Palestinian aspirations remains the central motive force for Arab identity all across the Arab. Arab leaders, on the other hand, obviously look at look out for their own interest and very often they are believed to be giving lip service to the Palestinian cause rather than any serious level of commitment. From the Israeli side itself, the emergence of uh, the right wing also gave rise to a, a, a movement which is known as Eretz Israel. Eretz Israel means greater Israel. This is the community, the movement itself was led by a group known as Gush Emunim. Gush Emunim represented the religious aspect of Zionism. The Zionism has many facets and it has a military facet, a fascist facet, a socialist facet, but now you see the centrality of religious Zionism. Religious Zionism has three fundamental principles. We cannot understand what is happening in, the, in terms of Israel-Palestine relations and the Gaza war specifically unless we have a full appreciation of these tenets. The first of these is that the Jewish community is a unique and distinct, distinct community. And the Jews are a unique and separate people. Indeed, they are divinely chosen. Therefore, you will hear the word, the chosen people. So they are a unique and separate and special community. Number two, the Jewish people have a unique attachment to the sacred soil of Israel. This soil has got mystical quality. This is a soil that has been promised by God himself for the unique use of the Jewish people. Exclusive use of the Jewish people. So there is not only a unique community, divinely ordained, there is also a land, the land of Israel, that has been given by God for the exclusive use of the Jewish people. 1967 war, first 1948, the, uh, the, the setting up of the state of Israel, 
and 1967 war, the victory in 1967, indicated that God was once again looking after the interests of his people. That this land, these victories of the Jews, had indicated that this land, which was till now controlled by forces of evil, has now been liberated for the exclusive use of the Jewish people. This land cannot be shared with non-Jewish people. If there are non-Jewish people present on this land, they either have to be exiled or exterminated or enslaved. There is no fourth option. But the unique land of Israel, which God has promised to the exclusive and unique Jewish people, has never been properly defined. If you go to the internet, you will see numerous maps created by different people claiming all these lands of Israel for the exclusive use of the Jewish people. It appears as if from time to time, any spot that has historically been associated with any prophet of the Old Testament is claimed as part of greater Israel. Therefore, some of the maps that I have put before you are very alarming. Israel is one of the rare countries in the world that has no constitution because Israel has no wish whatsoever to define the territory that constitutes the state of Israel. Therefore, there is no constitution. Israel only has basic laws that, are, that play the role of a constitution. What Israel does not wish at any stage to affirm constitutionally is what constitutes the state of Israel. Therefore, there is an open-ended claim right across the territories of West Asia, which can, at some stage or the other, claimed as part of greater Israel. Which is why you find that the occupied territories of West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem are not integrated with the Republic of, with the state of Israel. But at the same time, there is a steady encroachment of Jewish people into these occupied territories. And you will see the numbers in this regard are quite staggering. There has been a systematic expansion of the presence of the Jewish community in different areas in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. And you can see the numbers. If in 1948 there were in the West Bank 480 people, in 2023, there were as many as 450,000 people. Indeed, there are sources which, in, these are official figures, as there are sources that suggest that today, possibly the number of Jewish, uh, Jewish individuals living in the West Bank could be as much as 700,000. These are creation of realities on the ground. That means at no stage, Regardless of any settlement that emerges between Israel and the Palestinian people, will these be disrupted? That means whatever settlement occurs will, be, will have to take into account the physical presence of Jewish communities in the occupied territories of West Bank and East Jerusalem. But there is one area where there was a very small community, uh, uh, it is called Gaza, and it is in Gaza that in 2006, Israel decided that just to take care of six, 7,000 settlers, it is, they had to maintain several thousand armed forces personnel. They decided to withdraw the settlers, the Jewish settlers from Gaza. But Gaza was cordoned off by, uh, by, uh, by Israeli armed forces both the land area of Gaza and from the sea, and therefore Israel has absolutely no status of its own. It is regarded as the world's largest open-air prison 
with a population of 2.3 million Palestinians. At the end of the last century, an attempt, a major attempt, was made between the Israelis and the Palestinians to address the issues that divide them. These are known as the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords were extraordinarily important in their time because some of the fundamental divisions were addressed. The, from the Palestinian side, the state of Israel was recognized. Till then, the position of the pa Palestinian leadership and the PLO that brought together all the Palestinian group was that Israel had no right to exist. It was an illegal entity. Many of the Arab states used to refer to it as Zionist entity rather than a state. But in the Oslo Accord of 1793, the PLO recognized the state of Israel as it stood in 1967, that is before the occupied territories, it was recognized as a legal entity. In return, Israel recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. This was important because till then, Israel used to call all Palestinian resistance an act of terror and the PLO as an act uh, as a terrorist organization. But important point to recall that while these two uh, uh, agreements are important, the Oslo Accord itself of both of 1993 and of 1995 addressed, were viewed as interim issues. That means they were clearing the deck for serious discussion on what were called final status issue. Therefore, they are of an interim character. The final status issues were left to the future. That means we need to sit down to address those issues. Those issues are and remain to this day the establishment of a Palestinian state that was sovereign and economically viable. Sovereign and economically viable. So a Palestinian state that has to emerge in these territories that is sovereign and economically viable. Number two, what will be the capital of this Palestinian state? From the Palestinian side, they claimed East Jerusalem, which had been occupied by Israel in 1967 as their state. While Israel in 1967 had declared <clears throat> that divided Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, which was occupied in 67, and West Jerusalem, which was already with Israel, they had now become the indivisible and eternal capital of the Jewish people. And the third was the return of refugees. The Palestinians claimed that the refugees who had been displaced in 48 and 67 had a right of return. Israel rejected this because if you accepted the Palestinian right of return, then it would raise questions about the legality of the state that had emerged in 1948. That means you had illegally displaced certain people, illegally displaced certain people. Therefore, Israel's general position was not to recognize the idea of refugee. These were the three issues that were considered to be final status issues, which Oslo left for the future. However, there was no future. Within a short while, within uh, a month or so of their Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, signing the Oslo II Accord in 1995, he was assassinated by a right-wing Jewish person. That means suddenly you found that you were negotiating with a moderate and centrist entity in the political order, but you had powerful 
extreme right wing elements who were totally opposed to this kind of accommodation with the Palestinian people. They took very seriously, indeed, literally, the three ideas relating to the unique status of the Jewish people and the unique status of the land, a land that is there divinely ordained only for the exclusive use of the Jewish people. And that is why with Rabin talking to the Palestinians to accommodate their Palestine, their political aspirations was considered to be sacrilege and therefore worthy of assassination. After Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, you do not find any resonance, any serious way in which any political leadership in Israel is able to discuss the final status issue. Something else happened at the same time, and that is what had begun as a process in 1967. The, the, steady, uh, the steady consolidation of support for Israel in the United States now became a fundamental reality. So that Israel and matters relating to Israel were no longer a foreign policy issue. Israel now became an integral part of the US, US domestic policy. You had elements in Israel, in the United States, who had emerged in the late 1980s, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, who are referred to as neocons or neoconservatives. All of them are right-wing Jewish scholars who had total commitment to Israel. And in fact, critics used to point out that they were more committed to Israel than to the United States. They argued that Israel's interests and U.S. interests are identical and that the threats that Israel faces are the same threats that the United States face. Their initial uh, uh, our arguments were largely of academic character, but they were influential. They were able to influence U.S. policy. Say after the first Gulf War, you found that Israel, uh, uh, they were able to ensure that, the pol that uh, even after Iraq was defeated, it was subjected to sanctions and Iran would now become a demonized force. So you had dual containment of Iraq and Iran. That is, the United States, after defeating Saddam Hussein, uh, did not withdraw from West Asia, but now retained a permanent military presence in West Asia. Scholarship has revealed that much of the U.S. policy that emerged after the, sec after the end of the Cold War, much of U.S. policy in West Asia was influenced by the neoconservatives and the Jewish lobbies that you had in the United States. I don't want to spend more time in giving you a detailed account of uh, the politics and diplomacy that occurred during this period, but just to say that Donald Trump's period of four years was considered the high point of israel us in the United States, uh, uh, you had uh, in uh, the uh, very powerful forces that were playing a role in U.S. domestic politics. And at the same time, you had had from the beginning of the century, the emergence of a politician, Benjamin Netanyahu, who represented the right wing. And he had a very deep and personal bond with Donald Trump. So Donald Trump supported Israel had deep-seated hostility to Israel's principal foe in the region, Iran. There was Donald Trump was motivated by the support that he enjoyed from the Christian evangelist community. These are known loosely as born-again Christians. I alluded to them briefly, pointing out their, their understanding of the Bible and the prophecy of the Bible is based on Israel's 
total domination of the Holy Land. And only after they are dominant will there be a war against evil. And when that war ends, Jesus Christ will, will come back and rule for a long period until. But the point is that this Christian evangelist understanding in is very, while it calls for Jewish domination and control of the Holy Land, Jesus Christ's second coming means the total annihilation of the Jewish people. What the Israelis say and do is that they don't believe in any second coming. But if the Christian evangelist views mean that the United States will support Israel, so be it. So the second coming is something they can look after. What we want is to get support from the United States now. And that is what they have. So they don't bother about the details of the prophecy, which is actually adverse to their interest. Therefore, the Christian evangelist community, as part of its religious discourse, has supported uh, integration within Israel of the occupied territory. Therefore, Donald Trump ex uh, uh, accepted the integration of East Jerusalem as part of Jerusalem and indeed shifted the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. They also accepted the integration of the occupied Golan Heights. At that stage, Nathan Yahoo talked a lot about integrating the West Bank into Israel. West Bank has 3.7 million Palestinians, but did not actually go forward in that regard. Donald Trump talked about a deal of the century that would once again finally settle the Israel-Palestine issue. That plan was put forward in the public domain. It was rejected all outright by the Palestinian community as well as by all the Arab states. And it has been said that it was dead on arrival. But it did not mean that the Americans gave up on wanting to get the Arab states to engage with the Israelis. That is the game plan of the Israeli right wing is to expand ties with the Arab states without conceding anything to Palestinian aspirations. Note that over a period of time, as more and more Arab states recognize Israel and have normal diplomatic ties with Israel, you don't need to do anything about the Palestinians. This was the game plan. In August 2020, the first step in this regard was taken when, under American influence, the UAE agreed to normalize relations with Israel, and this was followed by Bahrain. This was referred to by Donald Trump as the Abraham Accord. I have rejected this term very forcefully because try as I might, I am not able to see any role of the prophet Abraham in this. And my own personal view has been that there is no such thing as an Abraham Accord unless Israel settles with the Palestinian people. I have argued to Israelis in the past that they are happy to send delegations to the UAE and to Morocco and even to Saudi Arabia and to uh, Sudan, but uh, and will go 5,000 kilometers to these destinations, but will not travel five kilometers from Jerusalem to Ramallah to discuss the issue with the Palestinian Authority. So I see nothing to do with Abraham. I also do not attack any strategic significance. There is a lot of cosmetic significance because at that time there was a lot of publicity about how the Arab states had begun to uh, normalize and the expectation was that this would expand. UAE is a small country. It is very rich in uh, energy resources but it's six or seven million people. They have only one million Emirates. That is, Emiratis are 12% of their own community. Indeed, our community, the Indian community, is 45%. Therefore, normalizing ties with Israel makes no strategic difference as far as the region is concerned. 
Bahrain even less so. In Bahrain, the majority communities, in fact, Indian, as it is in the UAE. Two other countries that so, uh, that normalized. One was Morocco, and Morocco is normalized because a they are far away from the issue. There is a very large Moroccan origin Jewish community in Israel who are very anxious to engage with their ancestral homeland. In the case of Sudan, the Americans put a lot of pressure on the Sudanese uh, on the government, but unfortunately. Their entire initiative was ruined by the uh, generals uh, subverting the democratic process. And therefore, whatever the Americans had thought they would achieve, what they were going to, they, the Americans paid a very heavy price for Sudan, so called normalizing ties with Israel. They removed Sudan from the list of countries they designate as uh, sponsors of terror. They promised Sudan $1 billion in, domestic, in, in, in development assistance. And this was actually an open bribe to Sudan. All of that has gone into nothing because of the civil conflict that is now uh, ruined in Sudan. Therefore, you will see that the Americans were playing a very major role in support of Israel in promoting these ties with the, with the Arab states. None of that has served any useful purpose. A little quick focus on how Israel has been dealing with Palestine. I've already mentioned the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He has loomed large over uh, the Israeli politics for more than two decades. He is regarded as an extremely wily politician. The, the name for him in Israel is magician. That every time you think that he has a weak hand and could succumb to pressure, he come somehow is able to come out on top. And that is why he has projected himself in his country as the protector of Israel. He is Mr. Security. He reinvented himself in 2015 as a right-wing radical. That means he shifted even further to the right with maintain occupation of the occupied territory and keep the Palestinian movement divided. There was a Palestine authority in Ramallah and from 2006, Hamas, the Islamist movement, Palestinian movement, had become dominant in Gaza. So you had a divided Palestinian movement, which Netanyahu argued was in Israel's interest. Netanyahu from 2019 has had a serious problem at home. And this problem has been that he is, has been indicted for, for breach of trust, bribery and fraud. And there is a case against him. He is not allowed to hold ministerial position. He can only under the complex Israeli law be prime minister. It is absolutely essential for him to be prime minister in the country. The minute he ceases to be prime minister, he will be indicted, taken before the court and possibly imprisoned. Therefore, he has ensured that he is always in power. When you had the elections in November 2022, they gave a divided mandate. He put together a coalition of the extreme right. These had till then been untouchables. They were hardcore ultra-nationalist and ultra-religious. Some of them were hardcore racist in their hatred for the Muslims and for the Arabs. They were brought into the coalition and they were given high uh, position. One became the national security uh, minister and the other became the finance minister with personal responsibility for the West Bank. These ministers, the Israel then, uh, Netanyahu initiated two policies. Number one, that he called for a sweeping judicial reform. He hoped that by emasculating the Supreme Court, he would be able to protect himself from judicial review so that he would be able to save from the prospect of jail. 
having done this, so but that led to massive countrywide protest. So from February 2023 up to the up to October, you find that hundreds of thousands of Israelis protested against it. But none of this mattered as far as the right wing is concerned. The right wing minister, in keeping with their uh, mindset and agenda, deliberately focused on expanding settlements in the West Bank and instigating violence against the Palestinians in the West Bank. The other minister deliberately walked through the Al-Aqsa Mosque during prayer uh, along with security forces to provoke the people so that there would be aggravation of violence. What they did not realize that these provocations were having a very negative impact on the opinion of the Palestinians. Palestinians who till then had been quiescent, relatively quiescent, and had not taken up arms, were being provoked. But what the focus of the United States and Israel was, not on what was happening within the country and the deliberate provocations in the West Bank and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, but the focus was on normalizing relations with the Saudi Arabia. That was the principal idea. And as a result, you find that till the attack uh, of Hamas on 7th October, there were indications in the media that their ties would be normalized. Much of this information came from Israel and from the United States. We didn't hear much from uh, Saudi Arabia. We do not know how close they were to normalization. But uh, we know in the media there were certain demands that the Saudis had made on the Americans. And those demands related to their own interest in, in terms of their regional status. Access to nuclear technology, access to the latest weaponry of the United States, and a security agreement with the United States in terms of with the U.S. would come, would militarily back Saudi Arabia if it was attacked. These were very controversial demands. And what we do know that at that time, there was a lot of opposition to the United States committing to any of these. Therefore, I'm not sure whether this was, whether normalization was as close as the Americans have been projecting it to be. However, none of that actually happened. On 7th October, you find that the Hamas pulled off an extraordinary initiative by attacking Israel on various fronts. Not only were large numbers of Israelis killed, about 350 soldiers were killed, the others were civilians, more than uh, 200 and odd, 230, 240 Israelis were also taken hostage. From that day, as I am speaking to you, the war is just short of six months. It's a week short of six months. Israel has re retaliated with massive firepower. More than 32,000 Palestinians are dead. But Israel has also shown a degree of ruthlessness by deliberately targeting medical facilities, hampering humanitarian assistance. And also, in this case, mass murder, as I have called it, overwhelmingly, the victims are women and children. What is astonishing is the extremely ambivalent role of the United States. My own view is that the United States has systematically discredited it. This is not news for us. We have watched this for some time. The Americans have been ambivalent. They have been. You had the period of Donald Trump where he unilaterally withdrew from the nuclear agreement but was not able to do anything in return, provoked confrontation in the region by the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, and then came up with the so-called deal of the century which served no purpose whatsoever. But what has been truly pathetic has been the presidency of Biden because there was so much expectation that here was a veteran politician who understood foreign affairs, had been vice president under Obama, and therefore was a credible figure. And after the nightmare of Donald Trump, it appeared as if a man with 
gravitas, experience, possibly wisdom would be in the White House. None of that has happened whatsoever. Biden has been the, uh, at what the nicest thing you could say about him was wishy washy. But more than wishy washy, I use the term for him pathetic. That it was never clear the way his persona was deteriorating, his physical persona was deteriorating in the public. Were indicated that he was quote unquote losing it. Nothing coherent emerged from him in terms of articulation and policy. There was a certain, with regard to Gaza, initially he expressed total support for Netanyahu, rushed to Jerusalem and stood by his side and supported Netanyahu. After that, from time to time, he would bleat the call for ceasefire without doing anything about it. In November, uh, there was a resolution calling for immediate ceasefire. The United States vetoed it knowing full well that several thousand more Palestinians would die immediately. After that, they, the uh, Biden has, because of domestic pressure upon him, uh, coming from sections of the Democratic Party, sections of young people on campuses, and Arab Americans, all of them taken together, have jeopardized his presidential aspirations. There are now indications that Donald Trump could be an extremely formidable opponent and that the decisive role will be played by just a few thousand people. For electoral consideration, you have seen him talking about a, a ceasefire, but the real remarks from the public have been made not by him, but by his vice president and by the Senate majority leader. Therefore, you find that there has been a serious absence of U.S. leadership in this scenario. People who have followed regional events are not astonished because we have not seen clarity of vision or a sense of leadership or a sense of being in charge and driving matters forward at any time from the United States over the last two decades. So it is not astonishing. On the contrary, you are aware that more and more Arab countries in West Asia have been shifting away from their alliance with the United States and have been, as, uh, have been asserting strategic autonomy. With regard to the Gaza war, I will share with you what I consider my first observation. This has been a serious setback, a strategic setback for Israel the kind of posture, the kind of image that the Israel Defense Forces and their intelligence had has taken a hammer. I have pointed out to people who uh, maybe had not noted it, when was the last time the Israeli Armed Forces had uh, participated in war? It was in 1973, all of 51 years ago. They have never faced a regular armed force since then. Who have they fought during this period on the basis of which their reputation has been established? Refugees. They have bombed refugees consistently over the last 50 years. Never a formidable enemy. Yes, militia have emerged. Militia have emerged not with the same formidable farm, uh, firepower. The other thing that we have seen now, once and for all, Israel is ruled by religious zealots. The extreme right wing of the United States are the exact mirror image of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State in terms of their uh, xenophobia. But here they have power. And while the international community ranged itself against Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, there has been no critique of any effective kind as far as these two extremists are concerned. But what we have seen is the extraordinary commitment to violence and wanton cruelty on the part of the Israeli armed forces. There is one more thing to be noted. From day one, the United States has supplied weaponry to Israel. An Israeli general has said that Israel could not have fought for a single day without American military equipment. 
Israel, therefore, has never been a sovereign or viable entity in West Asia. It has become an appendage of the United States. But it is an appendage, uh, it's an appendage character that actually carries more influence in the U.S. than, uh, that, uh, than, in, than an appendage should. Because it has succeeded in so manipulating American politics that no American today has the sea courage to criticize Israel, lest he or she be accused of anti-Semitism. The Palestine issue is now once again publicly placed at the heart of West Asian politics. If the Americans thought and the Israelis thought and certain Arab capitals had come to believe that you could have normal relations in West Asia while ignoring the Palestinian issue, that has been proven wrong. You have the Palestinian issue remains at the heart of West Asian security and West Asian. And therefore, you cannot pretend that you can have normalcy without addressing the Palestinian issue. It is in this background that you find American leaders, including uh, Biden, talking about a two-state solution that has been never stated so categorically by Americans as they are doing now. Of course, Netanyahu has totally rejected. Arab states, particularly Saudi Arabia, UAE, and to some extent Egypt, are today caught in a bind. Their populations have made it very clear that they are totally committed to the Palestinian cause and to the Palestinian interest. But from the point of view of the rulers, you have a problem. Because this conflict has shown the effectiveness and the resilience of the Iran-led axis of resistance. The resistance to Israel is coming from Hamas, from Hezbollah, from the militia in Iraq, and from the Houthis in Yemen, the axis of resistance. Therefore, what you are seeing today is the emergence of a formidable force of non-state actors who have taken up cudgels on behalf of the Palestinians and are willing to put forward a robust resistance. This has anointed Hamas, Hezbollah, the Shia militia of Iraq, the Houthis, and Iran itself. And while there is normalization of ties between Saudi Arabia and Iran, there is likely to be a certain level of discomfort with regard to the ascendancy of Iran in regional affairs. And that is why you find that while Arab states continue to give oral support to the Palestinians, it appears as if nothing really serious in support of the Palestinians has actually emerged from the West Asian state, from the Arab states. These are my first observations. There is something to be said about one space which is something far away from the Gaza war and yet lethal in its implications. These are the Houthis of Yemen. They have come to public attention when in the context of the Arab Spring uprisings, they had occupied Sana and from 2014 insisted on a certain military, political and economic role in Yemen which had been denied to them by Saudi. From March 2015, the Saudis had launched military strikes upon the Houthis, upon the Yemeni. But despite the fact that the Saudis had access to some of the most valuable equipment, military equipment the Americans could provide them with, and the Houthis were a ragtag group largely dependent on 
stocks of weaponry available in Yemen itself, as also what the Iranians could send across to them, they have been able to hold the Saudis at bay for eight years. In August 2022, the Saudis entered into, in April 2022, the Saudis announced a truce, a ceasefire. That ceasefire has remained in place and certain discussions have been taking place between the two sides. But the Gaza war has changed the scenario. From November 2023, you find, uh, from October 2023, you find massive firepower being directed by the Houthis at Israel itself, as also on shipping within the, uh, within the Red Sea area and the Red Sea littoral area spaces as well. The Americans and the British have retaliated with massive attacks on facilities that the Houthis had. But now, nearly six months later, you find the Houthis continuing to direct considerable firepower at shipping. Global shipping and therefore global trade is today seriously jeopardized by this so-called ragtag group in the corner of the Arabian Peninsula. You find ships being diverted out of the Red Sea round the Cape of Good Hope. And at the end of March, the Houthis announced that this was not going to be acceptable to them. They have also announced that they have access to the hypersonic missile, which will enable them, which goes at very high speed, and it has trajectory, irregular trajectory, therefore makes it very difficult to strike it. We are looking at an extraordinary development. In that. When we look at this Gaza war now, we are we see very hardly any effective peace process because Israel is not willing to uh, settle. As we have said, the uh, Netanyahu would like the war to carry on as long as possible. Reports have said that he would like to see, to push the war up to November so that Donald Trump comes back into the White House and is able to back him. We don't know. Biden appears to be putting a degree of pressure on him. Sir, as I'm speaking to you, the delegations are meeting in Egypt and we don't know what will emerge. It is likely what the Security Council has done is to call for a temporary truce of two weeks during the month of Ramzan. That is all. Is As soon as this is done, for Netanyahu initially ignored the fate of the hostages. He can't do that anymore. Popular pressure within the country has Therefore, he is he's trying to see how he can get back the hostages while continuing the war. The Houthis have said that they would agree on the hostages provided there is permanent truth and the withdrawal of Israeli forces. What will be the shape of the agreement that emerges from Cairo remains to be seen. We are not aware of it just yet. There has been a lot of talk about the one-state and two-state solution. The two-state solution is a, a follow-up from Oslo, where, Israel, where Palestine would have a sovereign and economically viable state. The maximum that the Israelis have ever offered are certain minor self-governing territories referred to laughingly as Bantustans, similar to what South Africa had done uh, during the apartheid period when they had created certain homelands, the TBVC states, the Transkai, Boputa, Swana, uh, 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 Venda, these states were supposed to be sovereign states. Nobody recognized them in the world. They are called Bantustans and the same principle is being tried out now. This is the so-called two-state solution. The two-state solution is totally unacceptable as far as Netanyahu is concerned and the right. Indeed, as I speak to you, I am not able to see a single serious political group that supports this kind of accommodation 
with the Palestinians. What you have found now emerging at a very nascent stage is a one-stage solution. Something that will be seen way in the future where the Palestinian and the Israeli will live side by side in one state, a democratic state where each of them can fulfill his or her aspirations. These are this is how they live till the Romans threw the Egyptian uh, uh, the uh, Jews out, and after the Caliphate of Omar, the Jews were allowed back into Jerusalem and into the Promised Land. This is how the Jew and the Pal and the Arab had lived side by side until the Zionist movement came and announced that Israel would be an exclusively Jewish state. But it seems to be difficult because there is so much messianic value attached to Israel that this is a unique land for the exclusive use of the chosen people that prevents you from looking at Israel as a normal country. And therefore, you are not able to see the viability of either a one state or a two state solution. What we are looking at is what Israel has followed continuously for the last three decades and odd, and that is look at no solution of a Palestine issue, treat the Palestinian aspiration as a security challenge, manage the Palestinian population through an iron fist or as a security concern while developing diplomatic ties with the Arabs. This has been their approach up to now, fully supported by the Americans. Is this sustainable? Can the Gaza war be a game changer? Can the Gaza war create new thinking among the Americans, among the Palestinians, and among the Arab states? This is the something that we do not know as of now. And this is something that we will continue to look at in the month, in the weeks and months to come. Let me pause at this point and I will be happy to respond to any queries that anyone has from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was uh, a great job to simplify and explain such a complicated and a historically long conflict in uh, barely half an hour. So, uh, so there are quite a few questions for you. Uh, we'll take three at a time. So the first question is from Anil Pavitran. He's asked for your comment on uh, basically Mahatma Gandhi suggested that a one state solution would have been better instead of a two state solution to address the Jewish problem. So what is your uh, opinion on that? Yeah. Second question is from Padmanabh Rao Kata. He's asked that surely Hamas would have been aware of the Israeli power and uh, Israeli's uh, Israeli capacity to react. So why did they, in the first place, attack Israel, uh, killed nearly 1,000 people, which led to the eventual uh, death of more than 30,000 Palestinians? Was Hamas expecting Israel to not react or expecting them to come to negotiations? The third question that I have for you from the audience is... Uh, Considering the current American political scenario where it seems that it would be Trump versus Biden again for the next presidential race, uh, who will be the better option for the Palestinian future given the fact that both seem to have abdicated the Palestinian cause or the Palestinian people? So uh, let's take these three uh, questions first and then we can go on to the next questions. Yeah. In the run-up to 1948, when there was a very strong support for the state of Israel in Western countries. And a little after Israel was announced, both Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru were under intense pressure to not only recognize Israel that we had done in the UN, but to have normal diplomatic ties with it. What Mahatma Gandhi said is something extremely important. And this is something we must remember today. And this was a view of Nehru's 
play is said differently. Mahatma Gandhi was very sensitive to the concerns of the Jewish people. He knew that the Jews had suffered at the hands of the Europeans and that there the pogroms and the mass murder had reached its peak with the Holocaust. What he recommended that was that align yourself with the Arab. Be part of the freedom struggle of colonized people against British, uh, British occupation and British men, just like we are doing. We are also a diverse people. We have Indian, we have Hindus and Muslims and Christians and Sikhs. We are a diverse people, but we are united in seeking our freedom struggle. And that is what you should do. What the Jews, what he criticized and what the Nehru also criticized is that the Jews were conducting themselves like a part of a settler colonial enterprise. The settler colonial enterprise of the kind that devastated, that shaped the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, created white majorities at the expense of, at the, expense of the resident community, which were annihilated. Which were annihilated. So their criticism was of the Zionist movement functioning like a settler colonial project rather than aligning itself with the Arab as part of a freedom struggle against colonialism. What a remarkable view. And I fully accept this. The Zionists could not accept because they were obsessed with the idea of a Jewish homeland. In the late 19th century, an analysis was done by why are the Europeans so hostile to Jews, particularly when large numbers of Jews had become very as native as a European could be. They had shed their Jewishness in public to masquerade as European. And yet they found, despite their professional achievements, that they were a despised community. The analysis they had was that we don't have a homeland, that we are vulnerable to European violence because we do not have a home of our own. They did not envisage that the entire Jewish community would migrate to Israel. They just thought that if the Jews have an exclusive home, the Christian will be less offensive. I say this was a misguided analysis because they're having a homeland or not made no difference. As far as the Christian communities of Europe are concerned, for 2,000 years, they had viewed the Jew as the enemy, as the, as the community that had led to the murder of Jesus Christ. May not be historically accurate. And you will remember the deep animosity for Jewish people all through different European communities, culminating with Germany's uh, Holocaust, is it had nothing to do with the Jews having a homeland or not. But that was the analysis. In order to make the homeland project palatable to the Europeans, Herzl said another thing, which is very astonishing. He said the Jews would be the bastion of Western civilization among Asian barbarians. barbarians. That means they were Jewish people. He was projecting them as symbols of Western civilization against the Asians. And we Asians, he bought the, uh, the mythology of the European civilizing mission against the Asians who were barbarian and uncivilized and therefore unfit for civil of, of state governance, of self-governance. Nehru and Gandhi were not going to have any of that nonsense. And this idea of, this is where the Zionist thinking was completely skewed. There I, therefore, you could call it a one-state solution. And that sort of, it would have worked perfectly. The Jew should never have seen the Arab as his enemy. Historically, there is no evidence that Muslims had done anything 
against the Jews when they were in the diaspora. Jewish culture, Jewish heritage, Jewish learning was preserved in Muslim kingdoms. When they and they when the Europeans came to power, when the Christians came to power in Spain, they did not discriminate between Jews and they and the Muslim. They annihilated both of them. It is the Muslim kingdoms of North Africa that looked after the Jewish community. And I would argue to you that this was a very feasible project. I even told the Israelis once, and they were shocked. I said, all the time you talk of confrontation to me, but why don't you explore the things that link you with the Muslim people? We share the same prophets. We revere the same prophets. And we and therefore, that could be a good way to begin. But on the other hand, you use the Old Testament as the basis for animosity for Muslims who never did any harm to you, but whose land you have usurped. Anyway, so this is the explanation as to why Mahatma Gandhi was very wise, but uh, did not fit in with the uh, Western agenda, with the colonial agenda. This is a question put to me many times. Why did the Hamas attack? You should not imagine that the attacks, that the issues began on 7th October. That is Israeli mythology. The oppression of the Palestinian people is a consistent feature of Israeli occupation from 1967 till today. Not a day has passed when the Palestinian has not suffered indignity, incarceration, beating, annihilation, violence. How do you find that Israeli prisons are full of Palestinians? Even today, as I'm speaking to you, in this war of six months, 7,000 West Bank people are in prison. How many thousand in uh, Gaza have been taken into prison? I, when I was writing Children of Abraham at War, I had asked myself this question and I got the answer in my research. A Palestinian boy had said that we lead such a hopeless life a life of so much humiliation and degradation and physical abuse. I, this life is not worth living. I would rather pick up a stone and hit my oppressor and take his bullet in my chest. And that is the motive force. Do recall here, 2006, the Israeli offenses in Gaza have been in place. It is an open-air prison, truly an open-air prison. It is it, an Israeli, a, a Jewish person who visited said it is the world's largest concentration camp. They have no economic life whatsoever. 40 to 60 percent of the people are unemployed. They have no capacity for any economic activity because they are in prison. You have seen today. The Israelis will not, they have blocked all the crossings and will not allow humanitarian assistance to go. I remind my Indian brethren that we have had 75 years of democracy and hence we have forgotten that we were also under colonial oppression at that time. And our, there are people from within our freedom movement who took up arms against the, uh, against the British and took bullets on their chest. If you remember correctly, the oppressor gives you, uh, perpetrates violence totally out of proportion. You remember what happened in Punjab and that there had been a molestation of something happened and the people were angry and you had the rollet acts and therefore against that, the humiliation of certain people and the people had taken and there was sporadic acts of violence. How did the British respond? The British responded with Jalyan Walama. Today we celebrate Jalyan Walama. It is a national monument. Why did the British do that? They do mass murder. The colonial enterprise always does mass murder, hoping it will quell the population. But the population will not be quelled. I have recited this poem earlier and I will recite it again because it is so pertinent to uh, our own heritage and it will enable us to understand. 
एंड देट इज सर फरोशी की तमन्ना आज हमारे दिल में है देखना है जोर कितना बाजू है कातिल में वंश वी हियर दिस यू अंडरस्टैंड वेर दी पैलेस्टीनियन इज कमिंग That is my answer. Between so, Biden small and Donald Trump, small interruption. The assessment of United States policy. Sir, sir, is, uh, just a small interruption. Today, Can you translate. Uh, let me finish my question. Answer the third answer question. No, no, uh, second one only. I am continuing. Can you translate the uh, Hindi uh, poem just to paraphrase uh, 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 for uh, uh, non-Hindi audience? Uh, sir, for Roshik, that means the. we are impelled by the great desire for self sacrifice let us with our action test how strong is the hand of the oppressor thank you sir coming to the united states biden and trump are only the latest the united states presidents have been completely overawed by the activities of the jewish lobby and by the right wing republicans who support the jews and uh, uh, the israeli interest and of course very overwhelmingly the christian evangelists post cold war you find no president has had the courage to impose any conditions upon them. therefore it is a monster that the americans have created. i want you to remember this there was a time where india experienced the same monstrosity in the shape of pakistan did not pakistan western support for pakistan right from 1947 till very recent times today the pakistanis don't have the same resonance in washington and london that they did at one time but india was harmed and damaged consistently by this western support exactly the same thing happens with regard to the united states and israel and very often we used to argue when pakistan used to perpetrate terrorist acts against india that the americans never spoke up against them americans never backed india against pakistan so long as they needed pakistan for their own interest now that has not changed so from the palestinian perspective it makes no difference who occupies the white house because no american politician has the courage to really do things which are in the american interest or in regional interest they can only pursue policies that are in israel i had left my remark as a uh, open ended has is gaza a game changer we would like to believe that if 32000 people are dead if 25000 of them women and children we have seen the barbarity of the extreme right wing can we go back to business as usual we would like to believe this is a game changer but then i have to soberly say that the us israel alliance is so deep so profound so overwhelming that there is no capacity either in israel or in the united states to treat this as a game changer their entire interest will be to go back to business as usual this is what i fear do i have any fresh ideas of what else could be done in its place i really do i would like to see the arab states and other developing countries the loose remark we hear of the global south i'm not the global south today has more power more influence than when we were the non aligned movement in the non aligned movement we had just emerged from colonialism today the global south has economic cloud technological cloud we are major markets which are major players in this global supply chains we have an extremely talented diaspora do we have that kind of capacity i doubt it because in sec large sections of the global south have shifted to the right wing 
and are looking for alignment with the Western oppressor. So that non-aligned movement, at least, we were very clear in terms of our values and principles. Are we as equally committed to values and principles today, or are we looking at very short, uh, short-sighted self-interest? That we have the capacity, but what the West is trying to do is to divide the global South into a new Cold War binary, a new Cold War binary, which will ensure that Western hegemony remains in place rather than a unified global South that is influential. Thank you. So just like picking up from your last uh, answer about the global South, how materially it has become stronger, but I think the normative values that the global South began with have definitely eroded. But we've also seen countries like Bangladesh, uh, South uh, Africa, Indonesia using international law as a tool to intervene in a conflict which materially they could not influence. So it is also said that this is not test whether it's a genocide or not. It's a test whether international law is actually effective or not uh, in this whole question. So how do you see the role of international law in this conflict? How can it influence the actions of Israel? Would it be able to limit them? Uh, second thing, uh, again, uh, comparing with international law, another thing that was often sidelined in analysis of international politics is the pressure from the public. We've seen how uh, in the Arab states as well, how the current alliance towards the Palestinian cause is actually driven by the people, not by the rulers, as you also mentioned in your uh, analysis. So, uh, Ravi Babu sir has asked, can you elaborate on how the different Arab states have responded to the uh, current conflict? And I would like to add to that, could you also expand on the role of Fatah in the current conflict? Rolo? Fatah, uh, the PLO. Uh, in uh, uh, yeah, How have they responded to it and what could be their role in the current conflict? And then we'll come on to the next questions later. There is some, there is no doubt that there is a remarkable change in the global civil. The countries, we are seeing the rise of middle powers. Those who follow IR theory will understand that we are seeing the rise of middle powers as influential role players. Here you had in the Cold War a global binary. And everyone was either part of one or the other. And the rest were just left out. We had a voice. We work. They have all the conscience. But we had to struggle hard. The Cold War was seen as an existential confrontation. 30 years since then, 35 years since then, we have seen very clear signs of change. The change is not a new binary as the Americans would like to construct it. The change is the emergence of smaller states what we call loosely middle powers. A middle power is one that has the capacity to influence matters in a certain space or on a certain subject. That is the middle power. It has the capacity for it. And as middle powers come closer to each other, their capacity to influence matters increases to a certain extent may not reach global status, but certainly is influential and certainly is looked at. Therefore, we consider a new world order will be a world order where, which will be multipolar in character, which will create space for influential middle powers to make themselves felt in certain areas and on certain issues. This is not acceptable to the United States because the United States' principal concern is the retention of its own hegemony. And therefore, they will not. They are shaping the challenge from uh, the middle powers, seeking a multipolar order and rejecting that and shaping a binary. A binary between United States and China. China allied with Russia. Democracy versus authoritarianism. Rule of law versus anarchy and chaos. Overwhelmingly, 
the global south has not accepted this. It has not. But he is doing his best. The United States is doing its best to retain the cohesion of the so-called Western alliance. The West. It is. We thought it was past its use by date, this idea of the West. But it has got a new resonance because in the context of Ukraine, and they are hammering that resistance, uh, their resonance in the context of Gaza. But there are changes. The changes are that initiatives such as going to the International Court of Justice. Can, I couldn't imagine such a thing would have happened 5-10 years ago. That individual countries, particularly South Africa, it's a very impressive initiative. Because South Africa itself comes from having been a victim, was a strong ally of the West and indeed encouraged to develop a nuclear weapon. Do recall here, three allies of the West developed nuclear weapons despite the non-proliferation treaty. Pakistan, Israel and apartheid South Africa. You need three powers. Now, this is where we are. Now. Does international law matter? It matters only if the states concerned believe in the international law. Israel doesn't believe that. Israel believes it is above the law. It can function with impunity. Knowing full well the Americans will support you. They can carry out mass massacre and mass murders. They can commit every illegal act available to it and get away with it. So Israel functions, so an international law functions and is effective in places where you find there is respect for the rule of law in the larger world. But where certain entities believe that I am above the law, and that I can be above the law with impunity. Nobody can. I ask this question. Now that the resolution was passed, in the, so the Americans went berserk, saying they had abstained and therefore had a resolution. And Netanyahu went berserk, screaming why the Americans had not vetoed it. Do you recall what happened a little later? The Americans said this resolution is not binding. Americans said, this resolution is not binding. The UN Secretary General said it is binding. Uh, what do you do? That means on day two, the United States has already signaled the signal. This resolution doesn't matter. In Hindi, we call it Naam Ke Vaste. You abstained and you got a resolution, but you removed its all its capacity to influence matters by saying it is non-enforceable. Then you might as well have vetoed it and gone home. I have not understood what these people are up. I have not understood what the Americans are up. Because it is. it just goes on. I mean, it's a misleading. Sometimes you veto a resolution and allow several thousand more dead. Then you get vice president to say, I want an immediate ceasefire. The Israelis say, bugger off. Then you get the Senate majority leader to say something. Israel, Netanyahu is a liability to his own country. And Netanyahu tells him to bugger off. Nobody does anything about it. That means what you are seeing today is not serious politics. You are seeing posturing. As a student of populism, you will understand immediately. This is all posturing. It has no serious seriousness of purpose. No commitment. No interest in higher values. No interest in long term. There's no long term vision in play. Everyone is looking to see. Mera ab isme kya fayda ho sakta? What is what advantage I can I get? What is Biden looking out for? Is looking out for? Let me get a few more votes against Donald Trump. Let me try to look presidential. He's looking pathetic. Netanyahu said, "Let me prolong the conflict as much as possible," because I. Political survival of two pathetic politicians 
well past their use by date is the scenario that you are looking at today. Now, the Arab states. The Arab states are concerned because for some time they have got away. Saudi Arabia, UAE, they have reinvented themselves, they have been influential, they have been independent role players in regional affairs. No longer looking at the Americans. They are pursuing agendas which go, which have regional implications. UAE has got control over ports and islands in the Gulf of Aden and in Yemen, the Gulf of Aden, Perim Island and the mouth of the uh, Mandeb, Babel Mandeb, and also facilities in the Horn of Africa. UAE. Five years ago, you would not discuss UAE. Ten years ago, I was ambassador in UAE. It was not a political player. And today, it is geopolitics all over the place. Plus, UAE and Saudi Arabia have worked closely in Tunisia to subvert the nascent diplomatic, uh, democratic achievements. They have intervened to end the democratic initiatives of Sudan. UAE has played a role in encouraging Ethiopia to build relations with Somaliland. It is impossible to understand what they are up to. What I suspect is likely to happen is, for the time being, there will be no initiative towards normalization from the remaining Arab states because of their concerns relating to popular opinion. But it is not over. Israel, what the Americans, what the Saudis told the Americans and conveyed to the Israelis in the discussions relating to normalization, do something for public consumption. They wanted Netanyahu to make a statement saying, I am committed to the two-state solution. Without doing anything about it. Naam ke vast. But even that he was not willing to. Because of the right wing. His government would have fallen. If the extreme right wing had withdrawn, his government would have fallen. Therefore, he couldn't do that. Even posturing is not possible for him on matters that, that ensure the, the integrity of his coalition. So, it was not going to happen. But the Saudis were quite happy. It would appear. It would appear. I would like to believe that this whole business of normalization is now on the back burner and likely to remain there for some time. I don't believe the Saudis and the EU, Emiratis and others will give up their commitment to strategic autonomy. That has gone quite far. Right from 2021. In 2020, with the demise of the Trump regime, the Saudis assess that the United States is not a credible security guarantor and moved on and have built up ties with China, with Russia, with Iran, etc. I don't think that will change. Now, role of Qatar. Qatar has been an enigma because Qatar 20 years and odd ago affiliated itself with Islamism or Muslim Brotherhood. Now we know that it was done at the behest of the Americans. It had got resonance after 9-11. After 9-11, the Americans realized this region needs to be reformed and that the source of reform will be the Brotherhood. Why? Because the Brotherhood brought together the values of democracy and the values of Islam on the same platform. That means you that reform project the political reform project as espoused by the Brotherhood was something the Americans could look at seriously. Ten years later, when the Arab Spring occurred, the Americans were quite happy to see the revival of the Brotherhood. And that is the role that Qatar played. And therefore, Qatar was viewed as Islamic and built up close ties with Turkey. In recent years, their link with the Brotherhood has reduced considerably. Because the Brotherhood itself is not resonant. I have argued in an article in Frontline that 
they, what we are witnessing today is the possible retreat of political Islam. That means political Islam has just as extremist Islam you had earlier, socialism and Arab nationalism and socialism. Then you had extremist Islam. Then you had political Islam of the brotherhood. These have all efforts at resistance against the order. And all have gained. Autocracy and authoritarian rule has triumphed. But the Arab people have been constantly experimenting with new ideas and new forces, new movements. My argument is that political Islam is today on the back. It is no longer resonant with the aspirations of the people who are looking at a more specific form of popular participation in governance. But that is something which is of a domestic character. The state orders in different Arab states, the, the order, the political order, whether authoritarian or republican, is under stress. It is under crisis, in a state of crisis. So that is where we are. Qatar, therefore, does not espouse the affiliation with the brotherhood as it did earlier. Nor does Turkey. Nor does Turkey. Turkey is also more pragmatic now. It used the Islamic card where it suited it. Where it was showing that it had a larger ideological agenda rather than pure short-term benefits vis-a-vis -vis Syria, Iraq, Libya and the East Mediterranean. It has gone beyond that. But Qatar remains significant for one very specific purpose. It has a direct line and link with Hamas. At a time when Hamas was rejected by other Arab states as being an Islamic organization uh, uh, affiliated with the Brotherhood in terms of ideology, Qatar was its national manufacturer and party. Which is why today, even though Qatar has diluted its affiliation with political Islam. And Hamas also doesn't talk much about political Islam as its ideology. You find that the links between the two of them are substantial. The political leadership of Hamas is located in Qatar. The military leadership is in Gaza, but the political leadership is in Qatar. Therefore, Qatar has a degree of influence. In the earlier depredations of the Israelis in 2014, when large parts of Gaza were destroyed, it was Qatar that intervened and did reconstruction uh, at that time uh, in uh, uh, Gaza and also paid the salaries of the civil servants. So Qatar is an active role player, far more influential than any other Arab country. Egypt has a unique role and therefore you find Qatar and Egypt are working together. During the earlier period, Qatar and Egypt were estranged because Qatar had supported the Morsi government, but they have patched up. Both are realists, and therefore Qatar and Egypt. Egypt has its own clout in Gaza and in the Palestinian Authority in general. Do recall that Gaza was an integral part of Egypt uh, till the uh, till uh, uh, recently, uh, till the sixty-seven war. It was you know it had it had administered Gaza. So Gaza they have a clout. So I think the Qatar-Egyptian duo are able to manage this connection. That is why you find that the talks relating to the truce are either in Doha or in Cairo. This is very weird. Where, whether they can influence the Israelis, whether they can influence the flow of military activity in Gaza, that is an open question. I think their achievements will be time-bound and short. So, uh, the next set, the next set of questions. One question is from uh, Ravi Babu sir. He's asking about the evolution of Indian policy on the whole issue since right, uh, sorry. the evolution of Indian policy towards this issue since 1947. Then there are questions. Uh, about what are the possible aftermaths for Gaza after this conflict ends? Can the Palestinian Authority take over? Uh, and uh, then there's a question from Badri Narayan. 
he's asking is hindutva ideology similar to the zionist ideology so these are the next three questions may i respond yes sir so india's approach to israel stroke palestine was influenced by the mindset and intellectual framework developed by gandhi ji and Nair. and that remained because israel was viewed as a colonial enterprise as we called it a center settler colonial enterprise and therefore there was no way we were going to have normal ties the end of the cold war compelled fresh thinking which is reasonable because fresh thinking after all you can't have the same view forever and india had diplomatic ties with it open diplomatic ties with israel and from 1992 and those have now become more than 30 years old their relationship is very substantial though it is transactional transactional mean i need this from you and i give this to you what we need from the israelis is defense equipment they are now 8% of our defense import don't imagine this the russians are 40 to 50% the americans are 20% the israelis are 8% so it does not go bashak india has diversified its requirement and we look at the global market france and uk are also players and we look at germany and italy uh, where necessary so it is not as if there is a sea change do also remember that russia remain the principal supplier of the basic equipment the indian armed forces need that is the gun uh, the aircraft and the tank and the artillery so uh, that's not going anywhere certain high price high tech item will be imported from other sources israel needs that israel also has some technology relating to el electronics surveillance um, agriculture what i mean and that is a matter of understanding what we need and doing a contractual arrangement in that regard there is some rumor but i don't have hard knowledge and i have not pursued that subject that israel has some influence with regard to security upgrading of our security capacities that you know uh, and uh, i don't know how true this is and whether it has how substantial it is i don't know but i have heard loose talk about this though it is not in the public domain i have not read a substantial article in this regard now uh, to what extent is there an ideological affinity between hindutva and zionism i i i i have firstly before i answer i have to clarify firstly we know that zionism and numerous manifestations there was a there was a national cultural there was a socialist there was even a fascist aspect and there was religious there was a right wing radical you also have a a right wing radical that is secular and you have a right wing radical that is religious so you have zionism manifested in numerous ways by different people it is only now 467 that you have likud likud is a right wing party but it is quite different from the extreme right ultra nationalist and ultra religious who are its partners today but there is a divide and certain sections from the right are not part of the coalition the liberman for example Lieberman is very hostile to the religious right and the ultra nationalist because he is a secular person. He believes they are they are privileged and they are spoiled brats of the of Zionism. Therefore, Zionism has numerous manifestations. With regarding the Vajpayee uh, uh, period, because the Vajpayee period, when we look back, it seems more. neruvian uh, it seems more uh, neruvian than uh, uh, than hindutva but if we 
is Hindutva as we know it today an ideology with the deep ballast similar to communism, fascism, socialism? Or is it a populist movement centered around a larger than life supreme leader? We don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough to be able to say this. And hopefully one day either I or some other scholars will look at it. Because an ideology needs very substantial academic and intellectual ballast. But that is not apparent. The movement is old, 100 years old. But the intellectual ballast that should have been in the public domain is not visible. The same five or ten principles that animate the organization have not evolved over the last 100 years. This is my, my personal view and if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be correct. I'm not a scholar. I'm a student of uh, Hindutva as I'm a student of Zionism. Are the two of them therefore affiliated? You know, the only thing, the only thing that unites Zionism and Hindutva is that Zionists have a Palestinian enemy who is a Muslim and the Hindutva whatever passes for their public posture is overwhelmingly hostile to the Indian Muslim community. They can't say Muslims in general because some of their best friends abroad are Muslim, like the rulers of Saudi Arabia. The rulers of, so it's not an anti-Muslim movement so much as it's hostile, or rather it has shaped its persona in terms of hostility to the Indian Muslim. And they have some caveats attached to that, but overwhelmingly the, the discourse, if I can use this word, is overwhelmingly anti-Indian. That is what unites them. And large sections of the Hindutva are very happy when the Israelis kill a large number of Palestinians. And, and the Zionist has found this opportunistically is useful. There was in the recent just a few weeks ago, in the public domain, documents were released from the foreign, from the Israeli Foreign Office archives, which spoke of RSS and Jensen reaching out to the Israeli consulate in Bombay on ideological. And the report of the Israeli consul general is that these are a bunch of fascists <laughs> who are approaching us because they think that our enemies are also Muslims. Right? Uh, this is uh, You read that, that report is very... Uh, he, he called them fascists, this bunch of fascists. And they have visceral hatred for Muslims. But otherwise, is there anything that would give you a kind of affinity, for example, an affiliation? The hero figures for some sections of indo are from the fascist heritage of Europe, which is the deep hate, which is obviously the enemy of the Jewish Zionist, whatever the shape or form of that Zionist. Uh, if you see the writings of Mr. Goldberg, there has been, you know, the, what I have noted is that Hindu were struggles to draw support for its mindset and it seeks to build its intellectual base by drawing on parallels from completely different cultural experience. Mr. Savarkar looked at Mazzini and the resurgence of the Italian identity. Mr. Goldworker found a certain merit in looking at Mr. Adolf Hitler in his time. Then there has been certain, in keeping with Indian uh, time, they have tried to moderate it. Then they tried to. So much of it has been in the political domain 
not in the intellectual domain. And that chasm exists. Zionism was also very active politically. It is no longer a robust ideological movement of the kind. It doesn't bring the Jewish people together. The Zionist movement was basically aimed at creating the state of After that, it is politics as usual. Five parties. Nobody talks of Zionism anymore. In Israel, you have parties which are extreme ultra-nationalist, ultra-religious, right-wing, right-wing secular, center-left, center, center left and leftist. Right? For a long period, Israel was ruled, ruled by the left-wing uh, until 67. From time to time, they come out and they re-emerge. So, it is a broad divisions of this kind. This you don't have in Hindutva just yet. Hindutva is still a very narrow, therefore I called it populist, centered around the persona of a supreme leader rather than an intellectual man. And it does not have the variety and variation of Zionism. And today, Zionism is faded away as a movement because it doesn't unite people. The last question put to me was, where do we go from here? This is the dilemma that I have raised. Is Gaza a game changer? Or is Gaza going to lead to business as usual? From the Israeli government point of view, the position that is shared by all different parties is to manage the problem of Palestine, not seek to solve it. Manage Palestine by giving them droppings of self-administration. Palestine authority, some power, some allow somebody to fund you, and keep the movement divided. So that intra-Palestine politics remains in place, as, and Israel has a free hand. From time to time, when the Palestinians get a pity, whack them. Hit them hard. You remember in 2019, the Palestinians in Gaza adopted a Gandhian approach. They said, walk to the border. They're talking about return of refugees. Walk to the border against the land, which is being commemorated yesterday and today also. Walk to the land. That is how land they were dispossessed. And the Israelis replied to them with sniper fire and killed 200 of them. Though these guys were there, the Palestinians had not even a stone in their hand. But with sharpshooters, hit straight into the head and killed the person. Just like the journalist was killed two years ago, uh, uh, you know, with a sniper fire. So this is the way they do. Use force to curb it not to solve it. This is their pattern as far as Palestine is concerned. Because anything else requires you to take a fundamentally new approach in terms of your own thinking, your ideology, your commitments, etc. And so long as the Americans are there, there is no pressure upon you from anybody to do anything. So I think that from the Israeli point of view, it will be business as usual. I don't believe that there is any force functioning at present that can change this scenario. Would the Americans do this? Whenever I mentioned the Americans, my friends challenged me and said, tell me in the last 50 years, what have the Americans demanded of Israel that the Israelis didn't want to do, but succumb to American pressure? Never. Never. There is not a single instance that the American quote-unquote pressure has ever been exerted or if it was exerted, ever be accomplished its end. Never. It's always the Israeli who has had his way. Doesn't matter who is in charge. I, I sometimes look at Rabin. Rabin is remembered because he was a martyr. He was killed. But could Rabin have delivered 
on a two state solution i'm not sure there's no evidence that he could have he needed that interim arrangement maybe he was looking at look let's have some arrangement and then move forward ehud barak was the wrong man at the wrong place at the wrong time he was a weak politically he was looking at election he was talking with the support of clinton who had already lost the election Democratic Party had lost the election when you had Camp David, Camp David too. Therefore, the maximum that Barack could offer, which was connected with his electoral prospects, was not even minimally acceptable to Yasser Arafat. And later on, when it failed, it all the blame was put on Yasser Arafat. Now, of course, we know different that we have an objective understanding of what Barack could offer. No sovereign state was ever offered by Barack. Everything they said yes, self-governing entities which are called Baltistan. Even on Jerusalem, they said Jordan will manage the mosque of Al-Aqsa, but, so, but Israel will have sovereignty over the Second Temple, the land or the space of the Second Temple, and even Al-Aqsa security control will be with Israel. So all of that is there. I have not seen. A serious role player in Israeli affairs who can discuss the possibility of either a two-state solution. A one-state solution is not something which you can discuss because that is way into the future. So my aftermath is, my fear is that with all the death and destruction we have found and all the sound and fury we have seen, it will at the end of the day signify nothing. So one final question before we close the session. There have been concerns that uh, this conflict might spill over in the wider region. Uh, there are assumptions that Israel and neocons want to draw in is Iran into a full frontal war. And this could be catastrophic for the wider West Asia. There have already been a strikes in Syria by both Israel and Iran. Uh, Syria is an open ground for everyone and anyone at this point. So what do you think is the future for the wider region? And do you think the conflict, current conflict can spill over to the wider region? My sense is that there is no one in West Asia who would like to see a larger regional confrontation. There is no one anywhere. The reason is simple. A larger conflagration will address no issue. Its outcome is uncertain. And what will you get at the end of that? No one wants that. So it will be just death and destruction with no net. Only a few hotheads, I think largely posturing, talk about taking on Iran. But Saddam Hussein tried that. He thought it would be over in six months. And eight years later, you had a truce. Saudis attacked Yemen. And they thought it would be over in three months. And it has gone on for eight years. I always have in my mind the example of the First World. And that is this. Not a single person in Europe wanted a larger conflagration, nor did not a single person expected one. And yet, the continent sleepwalked into me. That continued for five and killed several million people. And resolved nothing because you had another war a little later, even more destructive. Therefore, what I fear is not, war is not a rational option. Nor do I believe it will be pursued by any sane individual. I don't believe Khamenei wants it. I don't need, believe Netanyahu wants it. I don't believe Biden wants it. I don't, certainly not the Saudis or the Emirates. Nobody. Sleepwalking. Sleepwalking into it. That is what worries me. That's why I always prescribe that book. It's called The Sleepwalkers. Sleepwalkers is a very valuable book for diplomats. 
and for politicians and stage. How mistakes can, misperceptions can lead to hope. For example, today you have these Houthi attacks. If the Houthis were to, one of their wretched missiles were to take out a prominent target in Israel, Israel would be called upon to retaliate. Will they confine themselves to Yemen? What about Hezbollah? What about Iraq? What about Iran itself? Therefore, this scenario is lethal. A lethal with is full of lethal possibilities and prospects. And that, and since no one is addressing the core issues that divide and engender conflict. No, the issue is never being addressed. We are always doing king at palliatives. So what you may finally have is a truce, maybe slightly longer term truce, and go back to business as well. This is what I fear. Palestine Authority can be revamped, Mahmoud Baddha Abbas can retire, somebody else can come in. What about the Hamas? It's an eradication of Hamas. Hamas is a movement, also a political movement. Can Hamas be some shape or form may participate in election? After all, they participated in elections and won the election. In And why Mahmoud Abbas never resigned after his term? Ten years ago, he finished his term. It's because there is legitimate fear in the whole region that Hamas will win a democratic election in the occupied territories. So, we don't. I would say to you that as of now, we have to look at the scenario of business. There will be, once there is truce in place, there will be political revamp in Israel. There will be a political revamp in the Palestine Republic. There will be reconstruction activity in Gaza. And that is all. Thank you, sir. And uh, it has been a great discussion. It has been very enriching. And it has been, uh, you know, very, like, it has answered as many questions and left us with more questions when it comes to this uh, ongoing conflict. I would like to thank uh, you for your valuable time. I would also like to thank uh, Ravi Babu, sir, and the rest of the team at Anik Dhara for organizing this session. I think we can close now. We've been going on for nearly two hours now. Uh, Ravi Babu, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, sir, thank you very much. The content and the presentation was excellent. We're getting compliments, which we'll share separately. You covered a complex issue in simple terms. Man, uh, exposed, uh, stated it in much simple terms, but with clear explanation. And also shown the lines where there are uh, you, where the solutions are not yet visible and all that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chetan. It's a wonderful moderation by you uh, uh, because the questions, the way you pose the questions and uh, posited them to the speaker is excellent. I also thank the audience on the uh, online who held for two hours, uh, though we started, uh, we thought it may go up to one and a half hours and uh, posed uh, quite relevant questions. So thanks to one and all, and thanks to technical support from Sadiq. Thank you, sir. We close with this. I wish you all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. All, all good wishes. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot. Mm, Anil, you <laughs> <laughs> Anil, Sir, I think you're disconnected, sir. Ah, this is, sir. Okay. Sir, I didn't know. Bite kill, I'll wind up, sir. Okay. 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 Okay.